Hello, everyone. My name is Oscar Morgan. I'm the moderator for today's presentation. I thank each of you for joining us. Uh, today's presentation is entitled Pandemic Driven Innovations Across the Lifespan in Telebehavioral Health. Our presenter today are Dr. Karen Fortuna, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry, Dartmouth Giselle School of Medicine, Robert Walker, Office of Recovery and Empowerment, Massachusetts Department of Mental Health, and Dr. John Bruno, VP of Faculty and co-founder of iSocial. We will have about a 40 minute uh, presentation followed by um, questions and answers. I would ask everyone to please uh, let us know in the chat box where you're from. And also if you have any questions to put those questions into um, the, the chat box or the Q&A portion of the, uh, this, this webinar. And with that, we'll begin the presentation with Dr. Karen Fatuma. Uh, so, I th so I think there's, there's um, issues with, with Karen's microphone. So I guess I'll, I'll go on. So we want to give an update on digital peer support and what's happening one year after the, the COVID lockdown. So let so Karen Fortuna developed this slide. She's the assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatry at Dartmouth College. And I've been working with her for about five years on all things related to digital peer support. And you're gonna hear a little bit about them in this presentation and uh, about our work together. So let's go to the next slide. So we put together a digital peer support certification about last March, we got together and we realized that peer support that organizations that offer peer support were in danger of closing because people weren't trained in how to use telehealth technology. Social workers had training, doctors had training on how to do telehealth, but they're really up until March of last year, there really hadn't been any training around telehealth technology for peer supporters. So, we put together a, a certification for peer supporters about what's peer support, what's, what are digital communication skills, what are some of the technologies that people use, what are some of the organizational and ethical issues, how to monitor digital peer support to make sure it's working, and how to, how to address a crisis over the telephone. So we were on the, we were on the um, assumption that we would do this two or three times and we'd have people trained. But so far, we've been doing this for a year and we've had about 3,000 or so people trained across the country and across the world. Let's go to the next screen. Another, since this, we're talking across the lifespan, another thing that we've looked in is how to use technology with older adults and older adult peer specialists. So older adult peer specialists are, depending on the state, a Medicaid reimbursable workforce with a lived experience of aging with mental health issues. Um, in Massachusetts, we use it, we ask people to be 50 years and older to, to attend the training and also have a certification as a peer specialist or um, a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, recovery coach for substance use. The, um, Let's go to the next slide. So
So we talked about up until up until the beginning of this year, really, we had our um, older adult peer support was done in person. Our training was a three day, eight hours a day in person training class. We soon realized that we really needed older adult digital peer support, that we defined older adult digital peer support as live or automated peer support services delivered through technology. And we found that older adults are increasingly using older adult peers, I should say, are increasingly using technology to deliver peer support services to address both the mental health and the physical health needs of older adults. That up until up until really last Monday, that our our state of Massachusetts has pretty been pretty much locked down and there hasn't been a lot of home visits for older adults needing services that most of it has been done remotely. So we designed we designed some a smartphone phone app called Peer Tech that peer specialists and older adults could use together. It has text messaging exchanges it has um video videos on wellness both physical and mental health wellness and it really it has digital data collection using momentary assessments so we can we can ask at the moment how people are feeling, how people are doing and offer support based on their questions. Let's go to the next screen. The Peer Tech app is, is one of the few smartphone apps that really is peer special, peer specialist mediated, that it's not a standalone app for the older adult, that it it requires the um, requires or um, encourages the use of a peer specialist with the individual older adult in going through the app, in going through setting goals on the app, and going through what what lessons on the app are you going to work on for the for the week. Um, it's really HIPAA compliant through two-way texting and video. Um, we found actually that despite what some of the, um, I guess the old wives tales about um, older adults, that older adults enjoy texting and get texting as, as long as, as long as we spend the time teaching them how, as long as they get the technology, they can get the texting. It's not really an age limited um, activity. Let's go to the next slide. What we found that um, older adult peer specialists are managing both physical and mental health issues through empowerment and technology. That As we age, I, as people with serious mental illness age, they're likely to have at least two comorbidities of physical challenges in addition to the mental health challenge. And we found that older adult peer specialists have really figured out how to manage mental health and physical health at the same time through their own empowerment, through um, taking charge of their health and through using technology. 
that older adults, peer specialists really help other older adults realize new capabilities later in life, in late life, that they share their role with uh, the person served as parents and as grandparents. And I think I like to call it sharing wisdom that they really, they really have the have the wisdom of older age. And that's something we found that that only works when people are closer in age versus the the usual workforce of 21 year old um interns working working in in homes with older adults that there's something to be said there's some benefit to the shared wisdom of age working with older adults and technology let's go to the next slide what one of the things we did is we came up with the um program the training called SOAR, Serving Older Adults Remotely, which is an evidence, which uses evidence-based practices to train peer specialists on how to work with older adults. We talk in SOAR a lot, a lot about aging successfully. There's psychoeducation about what depression looks like as you age, about what other mental health concerns look like as you age. We talk about, um, we talk about um, mind, mindfulness. Wow, I almost said mindlessness. I'm sorry. We talk about mindfulness and about radical acceptance as older age. And we also talk about about life stories about about an application of um narrative therapy that we found that most older adults myself included really want to make sense of their lives really want to to make sense of their story so far and as I like to say, we help people write the next chapter of their life based on their goals and values. Let's go to the next slide. And I think we're starting to run out of time. It's important to um, incorporate older adult peer specialists into existing workforce. And in Massachusetts, we found a um, that we've got a me Medicaid waiver to pay older adult peer specialists. So they work in the home and right now remotely with older adults with mental health concerns, with emotional distress who otherwise would be nursing home eligible or otherwise would be in a nursing home. So we're using that workforce and we're training our regular peer specialists in our public mental health system on this older adult peer specialist because we found that many of the people who are still in the system are in the older adult range. So having peer specialists understand aging and the aging process and working with older adults has been a uh, find. And if we can go to the last slide, just for our contact information. There we go, thank you. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to um, John or Oscar. I'm not sure if Oscar was going to do an introduction or not, since you're doing an introduction. I'll go ahead and take over. I'm Dr. John Bruno, and um, Charles, if you can pull up my slide deck, and you can move us to, like, slide number two there. So I'm going to be talking about a, um, 
a, a telehealth intervention um, that started out as a on ground in a clinic, um, social skills training for individuals on the autism spectrum, but it included a wide range of individuals um, that had social skills deficits. Um, and I was part of this research out of the University of Missouri. Um, and so what, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll start by just very quickly, just making sure that uh, we're coming from the same conceptual framework. So I'm gonna explain the conceptual framework that we're coming from um, uh, so that everybody's got the same knowledge base and then I'll talk about the intervention and then I'll talk about um, the pivots that we had to make after COVID and what that looks like now. So Oscar, go ahead and um, Charles, I mean, go ahead and move the next slide, please. Uh, so here's my agenda. I'll talk about um, autism and uh, and then I'll move into the iSocial telehealth intervention just to describe it, um, explain the different versions that we, we had and what we have, and then I'll move on from there. Next slide, please. So just uh, for everybody's information, I'm sure most of you know this, but in you know 1975, autism was one in 5,000 births and by uh, you know, 2012, it's one in 88. Uh, what we're looking at here is not a line, but a curve. This is exponential growth. Next slide, please. And so, you know, we're now in 2019 at one in 54 births. Um, if that, when that gets to one in 50 births, that's the same fraction as two out of 100. That's 2% of the population. Um, and uh, this also differentially affects boys that more than girls, which is what we typically see with genetic issues. Um, and so we've got one in 37 boys currently um, coming up on the autism spectrum. And uh, just for everybody's uh, knowledge, the current research is telling us that uh, this is happening in the womb. These are uh, issues are predisposed. We know this in the sense that when we look at data of, we go backwards and look at sonogram data, we can see that these individuals have larger skulls in the womb. Um, we know that typically throughout um, throughout life, they have about a pound heavier of brain matter. Um, and so this links up with those things. But I always have to say this when I talk to a group of people that are college educated, this is not linked to vaccines. You can't have a vaccine at two years old and then go backwards and enlarge somebody's skull in the womb. Um, you do not see a difference between boys and girls of something that's not genetic. And so just that piece. Um, go ahead, Charles, the next slide, please. So what is autism? Uh, so for everybody's sake, just to make sure we all know, this is a communication disorder. It is not a behavioral uh, disorder, a mental health disorder, an emotional disorder or illness. Um, it is a spectrum, and I'm going to be talking about the higher end of the spectrum, uh, sometimes called Asperger's, high-functioning autism, autism uh, level one, um, any of those. But um, on average, the typical classical autism is uh, usually identified somewhere around age four, but for the higher functioning guys, it might be starting to be noticed um, at six, but typically um, we're getting the diagnosis of a, a young child with developmental delay, then it becomes an ADD, ADHD with an, op, uh, an OCD or ODD. Um, and then as the, these individuals move into fifth grade, sixth, seventh, they're doing fine academically, but now the social skills start to show up and we get the autism label. So many of these individuals got no interventions at the high functioning level until we get to middle school and high school. And, uh, and now we're going backwards and trying to do something. Next slide, please. So um, there were changes to the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 came out in, I believe 2018, if I remember right. And they, uh, they changed the diagnosis a little bit. So they went from three categories to two. And for those who aren't familiar with autism, it's got to be a deficit in social communication and social interaction paired with restrictive or repetitive patterns of behavior. For the high functioning guys, this will be um, restrictive patterns of, of interests. We, they will get stuck on cars or trains or washing machines or whatever their highly interest is. Um, the new definition did away with all of those labels, Asperger's, PDD, NOS, and it went to a severity level of a one, two, or three, a one being a mild, needing a mild amount of support, a two, a moderate amount, and a three is significant. So what I'm going to be talking about are the individuals with average to above average IQs. That would be a autism severity one in this model. Next slide, please. So our conceptual framework that iSocial is built off of begins with the understanding that what we find in um, 
a unique neurodiversity of individuals on the autism spectrum. A typical baby when they're born, um, when they look at mom's face, they get a hit of dopamine right in the middle of the brain. And that dopamine is there um, as a survival mechanism, probably you know, in survival tribal prehistoric days where we needed to know mom's face because mom's face, you better know it because that's who feeds you. You better know who looks like mom because that's your tribe. And so all of those mechanisms are built into a typically developing brain. But for these individuals, they are not getting this hit of dopamine. And so they do not study their mother's faces. And when we look at, at um, research looking at eye tracking, we will see that they're not looking at the eyes, they're looking at the mouth where the sound comes from, and then these babies will look away. Um, and so what they're missing is a typical mother is looking at the baby and uh, they're narrating often, hello, look at you, and they're talking and the baby is studying that face. And then the baby's stomach might make a sound or growl or gurgle and mom, <gasps> And mom says, oh, do you have a stomach ache? And she lowers her eyebrows and she changes her tone. And a typical baby learns that a change in my body state changed mom's face. That face seems to be connected to this emotion that I'm feeling. And they start to connect nonverbals of, a, uh, of the, the social partner with body state. And they start to try making these faces. So a typical baby learns to smile when they feel happy and frown when they're sad by imitating the faces that mom is making that matches what they're feeling. Next slide, please. And so what happens then is that these individuals uh, who are not getting the sitting dopamine, they're missing all of that social communication. So mom is speaking, mom pauses, waits for the baby to make a sound or do something, and then mom speaks. This would be turn-taking. These individuals are notorious for interrupting. Why are they interrupting? Because they never got that lesson from birth. And also they're not, they don't know how to read the nonverbals. We can see this in some of the brain scan studies. So here's a, a study from Schultz et al. back in 03. And on the left is an individual um, without autism looking at a picture of a face. And what you see um, are those orange and yellow areas that are lighting up that have to do with, with language and emotion and empathy. And then the green and the blue areas are the back of the head where we make pictures. Now to the right is an individual uh, with autism looking at that same picture of a face. Now remember, this is a person, a face they're looking at. But what's lighting up instead is blue and green in a large way in the back of the head. So in a sense, our assumptions are that these individuals are thinking in pictures and they, this is an object-centered brain. So they are processing people in the place where a typical brain processes objects. Well, this is where the next issue comes in that our relationships with objects is not the same as our relationship with people. So I often say in my workshops that um, we all have a very close personal relationship with an object, right? And when is this object a good object? When it's telling me things I wanna hear, when it's, it's showing me my bank account and my, my, uh, my pay went in, um, you know, it's a, and when it's doing what it's supposed to do, it's working. When is it a bad object? When it's glitching, um, you know, when checks are bouncing, I don't wanna see this phone, right? So if an individual is not understanding the nonverbals, then they have no clues that these, these individuals are having their own thoughts. So being able to read the nonverbals does what we call in the literature theory of mind. It allows us to create a theory of the other person's mind, to try and imagine what you might be thinking. And your nonverbals and your tone of voice and your body um, gestures all give me those clues when I know how to read those. For these individuals, they were not getting that mechanism to teach them to do that. And so they were not getting um, that training in a sense of how to read that. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we get three uh, in the literature, three core struggles, theory of mind, central coherence. This is forest for the trees. So when you are an object centered brain, you can pick objects apart in great detail. Putting together is a little more difficult. And then executive functioning gets impaired. So for the high functioning guys, this plays out in working memory as they are working so hard to decode the environment and try and figure out the social groups. They're using lots and lots of, of working memory, reading clues that are not important because they don't know the salient clues. And so therefore we get impairments in their ability to plan and organize um, and deal with problems as they come up. Uh, next slide, Charles, please. So iSocial began with research from Dr. Janine Steister at the University of Missouri 
Um, and it was called the Social Competence Intervention in the Literature. 18 peer-reviewed studies. It's built on a, a small group uh, intervention with 32 sessions of scaffolded instruction. And again, it was targeted for high-functioning autism um, and others with those unique constellations. And it was a, it's an intervention that was designed to go right at theory of mind, emotion recognition, and executive functioning. Next slide, please. So the model uh, is built on a scaffold instruction. It begins with five units, uh, recognizing facial expressions. And so here, um, what Dr. Cecer came up with was a, a specific way to read a face. We call it the triangle scanning method. It's an upside down triangle. And we teach the individuals in these sessions to read the eyes, then the eyebrows, then the mouth, and then the forehead and the head tilt. And so as they learn a systematic way to read a face in a particular order, their executive functioning skills get um, relaxed because they now have a technique. They now know what to pay attention to. And so all of a sudden where they were paying attention to all of this, they know that they only have to pay attention to this and it frees up that working memory to look at other things. We then get them to identify what is uh, uh, the different emotions that go with those faces. Then this intervention moves into sharing ideas. Here, we start moving into listener and speaker differences. The majority of the errors that these individuals are making with social skills deficits is they're not learning to read the listener. So they're not learning to read that if the person's not looking at you, they may not have known that you started talking. And so you, or you may not be, look, if they're not looking at you, they're talking to somebody else and you're interrupting. Working on interrupting is, is, teaching them to learn to wait for a pause, which means they have to watch the listener, right? Um, sharing ideas. How do you know if you're sharing too much? In a typical autism technique, you'd say 50-50. It's like a tennis match hitting the ball back and forth. Well, when someone's looking at their phone and at their wristwatch, 50-50 ain't going to cut it. They ain't got time to hear your whole thing. And so what you need to do is learn to read the listener. And then you know by looking and seeing if they're still interested. So this is where sharing ideas gets taught. Um, then it moves into turn taking and conversation. And now you learn the efficient ways to enter a conversation, um, join your topic to the topic that was already going on and how to exit a conversation. Then all of those skills are built upon to move into recognizing feelings and emotions. So unlike the first unit, which was is working on labeling emotions, now we're gonna get at that issue of connecting your face and what your body language looks like to match your emotion. And so we actually do let inter, um, um, practicing making faces and matching them to what's going on in your body. And we have them practice making five different levels of, of anger, five different levels of. And, and so we start to tune their, their, um, their facial expressions to match their emotions. And then only then do we move into problem solving and we give them a systematic way to assess the level of the problem and also um, decide the best uh, strategy for those problems. Next slide, please, Charles. And so um, the research used the um, many different measures, the brief, the SRS, which is the social skills rating scale um, by Constantino. And uh, rather than targeting specific skills that were taught in the intervention, they were measuring these global measures and you see uh, some of the effect that the interventions had. Next slide, please. Um, one of the interesting things was this research was being done out of the Thompson Center, which is one of the premier autism research centers in the nation. And they had someone there when Dr. Cecil was beginning this research who was doing fMRI studies. And that person said, hey, how about we put one of these individuals, do some pre and post. And so what you're seeing here is the first slide is that working memory area. And they were given a problem solving task. And then on the right is the post intervention of that same problem solving task. And what you see is, um, while this isn't a large enough sample to say we can generalize this, but it's interesting to notice that the working area memory, the, the area of the brain that, that is using up lots of energy for working memory initially is now minute. And so again, it, it, it hints at that these individuals become more comfortable, more relaxed, less anxious as they learn to decode that environment and decode the listener. And they learn how to um, then problem solve more efficiently. Charles, next slide, please. So the original version was first normed with, um, with adults, then a, a high school version, elementary version, and then the adolescent middle school version, which is where I came in and, and got involved with the project when they were in their last phases. And then they also had a grad student who was into uh, 
virtual reality and um, gaming, and they actually created a version in which avatars, uh, individuals created avatars, and they move through these lessons with their avatars. That version, unfortunately, was created in Sun Microsystems, and when that went out of business, that whole platform had um, had no way to be uh, transformed, and so that that particular part of the intervention is dead in the water. Um, when this research was done, Mizzou contacted a, uh, um, a tech investor to say, hey, do you want to convert this into a commercialization? We st they then said, call John Bruno, and that's how I come in. Um, as we were getting ready to convert all of this and look for the, the, the money to do all these big conversions into today's gaming technology, COVID hits. And so we pivot and we take the on-ground version and we turn it into a Zoom version. And in doing that, we then ran a beta session with, with um, six adults and we got all the kinks out and then we rolled into commercialization. And so uh, what we've got is a Zoom version of this intervention where um, we are now working with um, autism clinics, ABA providers, speech and language pathologists who were looking to do a social skills group. But more importantly, we've got an intervention that can reach uh, really the rural areas that have, uh, we've got one client out in, uh, in the corner of Kansas and their closest speech language therapist is in Denver, 200 miles away. And so for the first time, this individual could get, um, speech language, uh, uh an intervention that is uh, geared towards working on these social skills. Um, we also found that very quickly, our biggest um, clients were coming from the adult population, parents who said, you know, they're out of school. They, they've some have even gotten college degrees and they don't have the social skills. And so uh, we uh, started uh, adapting for those adult groups and that's become one of our large areas. So now we're working with corporations that are looking at those pipelines of getting these individuals into high tech jobs. Um, I'm working with job coaches and training them and using the this intervention to then um, supplement these guys to be successful on the job site. Higher education is also looking at um, these individuals who often get to college and run into trouble with student affairs. And so they're looking for some kind of remediation. And so we are in talks with different universities for offering this as a college course. And then um, going on further is we are increasing um, we're being asked what next because parents are saying we want something else after this. And so we are now building a new, um, uh, uh, not a version, but another uh, 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 intervention that will get more at applying things for the workforce management and things like that. Charles, next slide, please. Um, and so that's iSocial, um, kind of just a, a quick review for you. And that's what we're doing. And I'll turn it back over to Oscar. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening and for um, uh, Rob. And uh, we do have a couple questions that I would like to ask our presenters. And I'm going to start um, with um, with John. Um, first, let me ask this, Dr. Um, Latuna, are you on now? I am. Can oh, you hear great. me? Great, 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 great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start you. with... Uh, with, with John. Um, the first one is, um, what is the contributing to the ex exponential growth in autism? Is it, is it because okay. it was not uh, diagnosed in the past? Right. So um, the, whenever you see a curve instead of a line, you've got multiple variables, right? If it was one mm -hmm. thing, then what would happen is we could forecast it out and we could say, hey, we changed the diagnosis or um, and we could project out what that growth should look like. It would not be exponential. Um, when you've got exponential growth, you've got multiple variables. So what are some of those variables? The definition has changed for sure. We've got, um, you know, pediatrician and, and psychologists who are all tuned in to look for it now. We've got better awareness. So definitely that adds to the increase. Um, the other piece is, uh, seems to be environmental factors. We know there are higher rates of autism where there's higher rates of air pollution and water pollution. The most current research is that these individuals that, um, that we can track with the, um, where we can, we can, we can see the genetic uh, conditions that are related to this. Um, the most current research is looking at that these individuals can be lined up for the autism, but there has to be an external trigger 
to set it off. So the research is looking at viruses, bacteria. There's a lot of research around good bacteria in the system. What we know is that um, these babies are, uh, are those larger skulls are often C-section babies. And we know that C-section babies um, are, are born uh, without that good bacteria gut load that you get when you sweep through the birth canal and the baby gets that sweep of good bacteria from mom. And so recent studies have actually done where they've taken C-section babies and half the babies, they've swabbed mom, swabbed the nose. And what we find is lower rates of eczema, um, uh, asthma, autism. Um, and so we're seeing that there seems to be a connection with good bacteria and the gut. We know there's a brain gut connection with autism. These guys are, are uh, comorbidity for constipation. They're picky eaters. And we know for uh, when we put some of them on anti-anxiety meds, their constipation goes away. And when we check the gut, we find there's good bacteria that emerges from that particular medicine. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids is the newest branch of the research because when they started finding some of the, the genetic uh, markers on for some of the autism, they uh, started looking for studies that had those markers and prenatal care, and they found the, the factor of omega-3 fatty acids in the six month of pregnancy was a critical piece. Then they took that research and went to communities that used to eat high rates of omega-3 and shifted to omega-6. And what you find is as that shift happens, the autism seems to go up. So lots of different factors. Thank you. Um, next question is also for uh, Dr. Bruno, but I'm gonna ask this for all of our panelists. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, um, what are the cultural considerations uh, when using this technology? And, and there, is there a variation in terms of age? Uh, is there a variation in terms of ethnicity? So um, Dr. Bruno, if you would like to start and then Karen and Rob. Yeah. So there's a definite cultural issue here where for the high functioning autism, uh, we definitely see a social class issue. Uh, uh, we see that this is much more common for um, individuals that are going to be taking their kids regularly to pediatricians that are going to be getting that are going to know to ask for it um, parents that are, are more alert um, and so we see a differential of uh, uh, under diagnosis in the minority communities and an over uh, not an over but a, a, a clearer uh, um, rate of, of an increase in um, the the upper middle class um, um, brackets. Um, and so we know that this doesn't also we'll see cultural issues where the same behaviors that might, you know, mild autism at, in the beginning, if if you're needing everything to stay the same so that you can predict the environment, you look like somebody who's obstinate. And so if um, people often say this is oppositional defiance, this is willful behavior. And so you will get a differential also because we get that same differential misdiagnosis with um, people from minority communities where it's presumed that your behavior is something related to choice rather than something that's coming from internal. So those are just some of the ones that I would pick up on. I'd, I'd flip it to Karen. Now I'm sure Karen can give us a better frame on that as well. Sure. Thank you. Just confirming people can hear me. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So uh, thank you, John. That, that was great. Uh, so in addition to that, and, and the research that we do in developing technologies, we incorporate an entire systems engineering approach, meaning that we're able to identify human factors related to people using technologies or not using technologies. And uh, within the, the realm in doing this, we incorporate uh, different types of methodologies, including clinic-based um, one hour meetings using an app or the technology and we observe um, and then uh, that's a more of a, uh, a, a an early approach uh, and then we do field usability studies and so then we, we adapt the technology based on what people say and then we say okay we but we have a new one now and so here's the app or whatever it may be um, they used to do this on VCRs years and years ago, and they give it to the individual, probably five to 10 people, and then they have them go out into the community. So within their respective social emotional environment, what is, how are they interacting with that technology? Um, so within that, you make additional adaptations for this. Um, and so the PureTech app that uh, Mr. Walker spoke to, this was designed specifically for older adults who have a diagnosis of a serious mental illness. And within that, 
we incorporated evidence-based practice features in the actual design. So what that means, it'll be able to offset potential challenges with memory, offset potential challenges uh, with cognitive impairments, just how we actually design the app. And so two examples could be um, that so the text is written at a fourth grade level. Another example is a single layer architecture, um, which facilitates learning and knowledge. And what that means is that when you go onto an app, you're on the home page, and then you go forward once. You don't, and that's it, that's a single layer architecture. You don't go forward, 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 forward. It's very confusing to people. Um, and specifically for older adults too, scrolling is very challenging as well. So, um, so within that, um, and also when you incorporate, now to speak to culture, and within that as well, you when you do these types of um, usability testing within systems engineering, you want to make sure you have your population of interest. And so if you're working with um, people in Alaska uh, that I identify as um, uh, natives of Alaska, that's the population you want to do this with. Otherwise, you'll need multiple adaptations for uh, different groups. And what's really interesting is that on some of the smartwatches, there's actually Mm -hmm. They've done usability testing on some smartwatches, and there's a, a light on there that uh, helps uh, helps understand. Uh, it's it's like heart rate in it, right? But a lot of people use this low value light, so it's not expensive, and it only works on a certain pigmentation of the skin. So anyway, it's quite fascinating, and so that's where people are leading out and not. Um, uh, achieving health benefits because some of the technology isn't designed for specific populations. Uh, Rob, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I would. Thank you. I would just like to add that um, I truly believe after the, the pandemic's been with us a year that internet access is a social determinant of health and that the access to technology is a social determinant of health that a lot of the um, a lot a lot of um, medical visits and other other um, health visits have been going um, going via telehealth and not everyone has the access and I think um, Medicare got some pushback when they tried to end the telephone only connection with um, health visits because older adults older adults in rural areas don't necessarily have access to internet or to technology so that's sort of the one of the that's an additional determinant of health thank you this is sort of a, a follow-up to um uh, mr walker's uh, response and specifically uh for isocial is that proprietary and then in general what is the lay of the land when it comes to insurance? Are these still considered to be um, experimental? Um, is it is are will insurance be it public or private uh, pay for the technology and for the, um, clinical services associated with the use of the technology? So um, iSocial is proprietary. Um, the intellectual property rights are owned by the University of Missouri. It's, it was um, licensed to iSocial to roll it out as a commercial and, and commercialize it. Um, <clears throat> we went through and, and got the billing code so that it could be billed for telehealth. And very quickly, we started running into all the things that everybody else who does telehealth knows. Well, you know, if you're going to be in Missouri and Kansas, then you got to have somebody who's certified in every state. And, Right. And the second thing was our model for this uh, this intervention was we were using the ABA group because we knew parents were used to that. And so we use that. And what parents told us without fail was, why would you use billing codes? Just bill. It. I'd rather pay because dealing with the insurance company, forget it. And so we went to private pay. And then so how do we counter that for those who couldn't afford? We created a foundation that then you apply for. We we use the typical um, scaling and we so I would say that um, uh, our average rate of pay is probably 75% of the full cost um, and uh, we are running and, and then we've got some who are you know we are basically providing for free because we 
we were able to counter that with the the costs that were on the other. So that's our model. Um, some of our our providers who are um, um, I'll call it leasing it from us, um, I'm subscribing it from us. They are using billing because that's their model. So it can be billed. It does. It it can. Um, there are billing codes for it. Again, we just found that uh, it it was without fail. Um, the, the majority of, of the people, the clients that we were dealing with said, it, it isn't worth it. Um, so um, I think uh, I think that's what you asked. And also someone I, I noticed said, is it a, uh, something about it? It's not an app. It is a social skills group intervention led by a facilitator. So, okay. Okay. Um, and then Dr. Fortuna, do you have anything to add or Mr. Walker? Yeah, uh, we, um... Just we have a very similar um, to to John as well. Uh, we work with uh, large health systems and organizations, and uh, from there we have this uh, the digital peer support certification, um, which is uh, internationally uh, known now, which is very exciting, um, and shows a high level of scientific evidence to increase capacity and ability uh, to offer technology-based services uh, with fidelity, um, and then through that onboarding training, um, then organizations uh, can um, equip their peer support uh, staff uh, with um, the, the peer support side of the app, and then they onboard uh, with the service users as well. Uh, we're also working uh, within state governments as well to get this um, uh, uh, working as a Medicaid uh, reimbursable service and uh, considering the uh, current pandemic we are in now and uh, the importance of telehealth and meeting the needs of individuals, um, uh, we're getting uh, some traction in that. And uh, Mr. Walker is a uh, um, uh, really great at policy and is helping facilitate our, um, our international team now on that, which is very exciting. Um, so Mr. Walker, do you have anything else you want to elaborate on there? Because there's a question about what is going on in the space of public policy uh, and advocacy, if to use that word, uh, to make these uh, technologies more of a public utility if one comes from the premise that health is a right. And we know there's a cost to it, but um, again, if, if these are gonna be limited to proprietary, you know, will it become accessible to, the, to all at some point in time, do you think? There, there are options now for people who are um, SNAP or Medicaid eligible through the SafeLink program, or I think it's Assurant Technologies out on the West Coast. So we, we have a um, the universal access charge on your cell, your uh, cellular phone bill goes to pay for these free phones that that they distribute they distribute to um, Medicaid eligible or SNAP food stamp eligible. I think there's another eligibility. And I also know the FCC had a big grant program earlier on in the um, pandemic to just for this to help help the inequity with access to um, technology. But I haven't seen national national bills. Um, and the Dr. Fortuna just mentioned the state assistive technology services to get the actual technology to people is another great. So there's all these pockets of excellence around to, to try to um, tap into. And I do believe that the Mid-Atlantic um, Telehealth Resource Center has an ongoing directory, if you will, of what states will pay for. In, in and so that might be something that uh, the attendees might want to keep, a, keep abreast. So let me ask another question, because this has been a debate with um, different um, technolo technological modalities. And that is, is it all or none? You know, do you, it, it will technology replace uh, what we consider cognitive therapy, face-to-face -face therapy? Is there uh, a medium where you use both, um, and one is an adjunct or a, a facilitator of the other, or can they? Or is it going to be that mental health professionals are going to have to learn 
particularly through their educational training, a new way? And how do you deal with that workforce in terms of their own adaptation? And I know there's a lot of questions in there, uh, but I'm gonna ask the panel if you wanna just talk about all of that, it's all of that. Thank you. Let's start with Dr. Fortuna and then go to Dr. Bruno. I can jump right in and I, I love that question um, because um, in our work with a peer support specialist, uh, we asked them what they think um, the future will be. And they said to us, well, you can't develop technology that doesn't include um, a, a human element, a real human element, uh, um, because uh, that might actually promote social isolation. Um, so we asked them, and then we completed a, a very large uh, systematic review with all of um, the peer reviewed literature in the world on digital peer support. And uh, we looked at engagement rates and we found the peer support um, uh, apps that are out there or any technology, the ones that had the highest rates of engagement included that human touch. Um, so uh, within that, um, we suspect uh, that um, the inclusion of these types of technologies will always include uh, that human touch, likely live, not an Autobot. The you know the, the scientific evidence uh, is not hasn't uh, decided on that just yet. Um, and uh, within that, that's how you're going to get those engagement rates because working with people with mental health challenges, uh, they commonly drop off of using these technologies after two weeks. And what we know. Um, uh, the best way to incorporate um, usage is through uh, the human factor. We call it the peer factor. Uh, this is also a model of reciprocal accountability. Um, and then also another model is out there, a supportive accountability and object relation. Uh, we see in the future the integration of digital technologies with in-person as well, and uh, hopefully uh, built on preference. So people have the option to choose how to connect. Um, I'll pass, I see Rob's on mute it. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Then over to John. Well, I'll just say real quickly that um, I, I see a psychiatrist at Mass General Hospital and he always jokes with me through telehealth. He always says that psychiatry is going to be the last one, the last department to go live because right now their no-show rate is 0% that they don't have no-shows. And for most academic medical centers, psych psychiatry has been a lo a losing proposition. So the, mo the money people, if you will, are behind some sort of hybrid value. But I'll turn it over to John. Well, I think that's a perfect handover, Rob, because um, Oscar, part of that question is, what are the pros and cons maybe, um, right? It's not an all or nothing. It's not an either or. Um, and so, you know, the surprises like that one that Rob just said, where, you know, people didn't necessarily want to get on the bus and get in their car and go to an appointment and see a person and all the anxiety of, and right, whatever the factors might be. We are finding similar things. I wasn't sure something that was designed to be on ground, sitting around a table, led by, by a person, watch each other, read the social cues. I didn't know how I was going to transfer into a Zoom environment. Here's what happened, and, and now it makes sense as I, as I talk to my guys. My guys say, well, on Zoom, I don't have all that noise around me from the classroom. I'm at home where I'm comfortable. I've got my cat right here, right? And so all of a sudden they were less anxious and now they were more open to receiving the intervention. The second was is when you're not perceiving the nonverbals of others, you don't know you're being perceived. And so one of the deficits of these guys is a very egocentric view until they learn that the listener is reacting to them. And so what they start had to do, one of our, our pieces is that we, we walk through what it, what it looks like when you're on this screen. And so you have to have your face in the middle. We need to be able to see your mouth. Your body needs to be calm. All of a sudden, for the first time, they're paying attention to their own image. These guys, you watch a typical Zoom meeting, we're all fixing our hair, we're just these guys don't tend to do that, right? I mean, you know, they'll, they'll pick their nose right in the middle of the group and you got to say, hey, that's an unexpected behavior, right? Teaching them to look at their own image, it turned out that one of the benefits of this Zoom platform was they are actually seeing the live feedback and then we could talk to them and say, 
well, you just made a face. Did that face really match the level of emotion? And so pros and cons in, in some ways. Do I think it will replace to answer your direct question? No. Um, I think there's something valuable about um, it. But what I'd say is for this particular uh, skill, we've actually found that we are simplifying some of the, the sensory input, which these guys get overloaded with. And now it's, it's a two-dimensional screen. They're in a comfortable environment. They can move. They can, and now the, 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 uh, the difficult parts are, you know, the further you are in Zoom from, from the, the host, there's a second delay for every, I don't know, a thousand miles or something like that. And so there's that delay. And so guys will start interrupting and, um, and not mean to, but, and so it's very difficult to figure out if you should pause and start or, so that's the, the odd part. Um, but I'd say the other piece is that um, these guys are pretty isolated already. And so, uh, you know, we're already, my group is already talking, the ones that are all in similar areas, or they're talking about a road trip, the adults, you know, we need to make a trip to Kansas City. That's in between us and, and our friend on the University of Kansas campus and us in St. Louis. And, you know, we'll get together and we'll go to the train museum and da, 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 da. Um, and so I can tell you that um, in a sense, it was like a crutch, maybe it was a simplified environment for the social skills and my fear that they weren't going to pick up the skills. What I'm hearing is when these guys got back out to the job sites, um, the job coaches reported that it was a, a, a transformation. Um, one of our guys who had been fired three times for losing his temper has kept the same job now since, uh, gosh, I think he's been on the job for six months now. Never held a job that long, right? And and the job coach says he's apologizing for his um, his statements where before he had no idea that he insulted people because he would say, you know, he'd use his scripts or his phrases and not knowing they weren't appropriate. Now he picks up on the reaction and she says, I can't get him to stop apologizing. So, um, so you, you know, it, it's got to be, it, for my, my skill set, these are social skills. They need to be used socially, need to be with other people. Um, but at the same token, it is fostering their chance to be a, a community. I will say we, the other thing we added was when we finished the beta group, they said, well, can we keep meeting? In fact, people were parents were saying, I don't know if he's going to get on and go through a class with you. My my Zoom thing at, at my six o'clock class at 515 was saying somebody had joined my Zoom meeting. And there was the guy just sitting, staring at the screen, waiting for someone to come on. Um, and so, again, that social isolation that my guys on the spectrum experience, they had a community. And so I said, I'm going to leave it on every Wednesday night. You just come on. And now we actually have a group that meets every Wednesday night online. We've structured it. They come and. They're talking anime, they're talking games, they're talking dinosaurs, they're playing Jeopardy, they're, uh, and it'll go three hours sometimes. And so again, pros and cons, I'd say Oscar, but I, I don't know that, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to ever eliminate in person as well. Uh, we have about time for one more question. And um, so is there a myth or stigma in that, you know, I hear providers tell me that under COVID in particular, they can't find people. <laughs> and they're losing money and that technology is not the answer because of expectation. So is there a myth that peers won't use um, technology or, and, and that families will not be receptive or is there a stigma to that? So again, we'll go around and then we'll close it out. So we'll start with Dr. Fatuna and then Dr. Bruno and then uh, uh, Mr. Walker. I, um, I do think there is a stigma even still. Um, I remember in 2018, which seems like such a long time ago, uh, Rob and I uh, pitched this idea of um, incorporating technology in within the peer support workforce. And when we pitched this idea to our colleagues, they, they you know, the first question to us was, well, what's a peer support specialist? Uh, the second question was, they can use technology. And Rob and I were like, yeah, of course. And so we, we actually did a study um, to show that, yeah, 95% of peer support specialists own and use technology. Um, and uh, I, I think that has potentially led to the delay in the development of um, the formal training in telehealth uh, for this um, amazing uh, workforce. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, all these other fields of study like psychiatry, psychology, social work, they have formal training in telehealth, uh, getting continuing education credits, uh, even at um, academic institutions. 
peer support specialists didn't have any of that. And what we saw anecdotally is that um, they were very eager to keep their doors open. And in a matter of three days during the beginning of the pandemic, uh, people were up and running uh, peer support specialists in their, their telehealth services. Um, and so um, I, I do think that potentially it is, it is a stigma um, that, uh, um, that uh, hopefully uh, will be addressed with um, all the great things that peer support specialists are doing. And uh, a recent article in Forbes magazine about uh, their work as well in tele telehealth too. Uh, Rob, I'll pass it over to you. What are your thoughts on that? I think that um, technology can be the telephone, that we have to focus on personal preference, that technology isn't always the biggest, brightest Zoom or whatever we're using, Remo or um, WebEx, I'm sorry, that Sometimes people prefer telephone that I know Dr. Fortuna is the clinical associate for a group of um, therapists that do therapy by text and people subscribe to it. So it's a different model of receiving therapy, but it's all text-based. And we've asked young adults and you think young adults who are the technology wizards Young adults prefer text to their therapists rather than Zoom calls. They spend all day on Zoom for school. The last thing they want to do is Zoom with their therapist at the end of the long day. So I think some of it is figuring out what the technology is and coming up with different ways of reaching people besides, perhaps besides the typical way of therapist and person receiving services. So I'll send it to John. Um, yeah, for the high functioning guys, they tend to be on games, they're on technology. Um, so it's not really uh, been an issue. Um, again, it was the parents not sure if these guys would get on another class because school now became, as Rob was just saying. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, we had to use some of the tricks that I use when I train teachers, which was, um, hey, come on early and you can talk about all of the marmoset monkeys you want to talk about. And and the group's waiting to hear about it. And so they would then have a reason to come. So uh, there's some that we, you know, we had to create some incentives um, for the adults. The, the bigger problem is, uh, you know, that whole issue of uh, um, the parents advocating for them versus them advocating for themselves. Um, parents are aware that these guys have these social skills deficits. These guys are not aware of it themselves and they don't see any reason to come. And so we're having to uh, think about how to um, uh, allow that group to understand what might be the benefit for coming. And so that's that's the issue we run into with the technology side or just the, the class in general. Um, as we're working with um, some of these universities and worldwide technologies and we're starting to develop these, we're starting to turn it into a, a leadership course on a, a communication course, something like that. And so that's something that would look like a certificate you'd want on your resume and then can say this employer is looking for that. Um, and that's one of the ways that we're now trying to uh, rebrand, I guess, uh, for that particular group. Um, and I think that um, Tanya Harris, uh, who I looked in the chat box, sums up this last discussion point uh, quite rightly, which is even in the world of technology, we need to be concerned about and focused on person-centered care um, and find out what works best for the person. So thank you, Tanya, for making that, that point. I'd also like at this point, because uh, we're, we're about to wrap up, does anyone have any like one more question? If not, I will wrap up because as they say, uh, the next thing um, is, is lunch. So uh, if not, I want to say thank you to our, our panelists um, and, and Dr. Karen Fortuna, Dr. John Bruno, and uh, Mr. Walker. I, we really appreciate you know, your, your presentation and the lessons learned in the discussion. I thought it was a very rich discussion. Um, and I thought we learned a lot. I learned a lot. And I thank you for 
being on the cutting edge, as they say, because a lot of what you're doing is really about the future and meeting the need at the moment. So we really appreciate that. And for all of our uh, attendees, thank you for attending today's presentation. Uh, Dr. Fatuna will be doing another presentation tomorrow. I don't remember the time. I will be moderating that. So I guess I better figure out the time. <laughs> and it's going to be more about the research. You know, what's happened? How do we get to where we are in terms of some of the research that she's working on and what that involves? So we um, going to ask you if you'd like to tune into that. And I'm very grateful that the uh, presenters have given you their, uh, their emails and, have, and invited you to contact, with, contact them. Please, please, please follow up on that um, because they are accessible and really want to make sure that you get the information you need. So again, I thank everyone, thank our presenters, want to thank our tech uh, supporter, Charles, for helping us out today. And everyone have a great day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Take care. Bye-bye.